Welcome to this Medicine Masterclass on Medical Ethics and Law. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the principles of medical ethics. We will be looking at autonomy, beneficence, non-malficence, justice, the philosophical origins of these ethical principles, informed and voluntary consent, the Mental Capacity Act, advanced directives, lasting power of attorney documents, the Mental Capacity Act, the doctrine of double effect, vendor relationships, opportunity cost, and quality adjusted life years. The principles of medical ethics. The key principles are autonomy, beneficence, non-malficence, and justice. These axiomatic principles of medical ethics are derived from a multitude of philosophical and moral schools of thoughts. These were specifically collectively published in the first edition of The Principles of Biomedical Ethics in 1979, which were authored and widely published by the ethicists Beecham and Childress. These ethical principles were derived from a multitude of philosophical, ethical and moral schools of thought. These include virtuous ethics from Aristotelian school of thought, deontological ethics derived from the works of Immanuel Kant, and teleological theories, which are the ethics of consequentialism. Aristotelian or virtuous ethics state that the acts themselves should be based on a most virtuous cause. And this was essentially worked on uh, Nekimachian and the Magna Moralia. These are the two key works. The key qualities focused in Aristotelian virtuous ethics are Prudence, which is practical wisdom. Temperance, which is self-control and moderation. Courage, the strength to face adversity. And justice, which is to give others what is due to them in proper ways. Deontological ethics. Immanuel Kant argued that it was not the consequence of the actions that make them right or wrong, but the nature of the intrinsic act itself and the motives of the person who carries them out. In moral philosophy, deontology is the ethical theory that the morality of an action should be based on judging the action itself rather than the outcome of the action. Contrast that to teleological ethics or consequentialism. Here, the assertion is that the consequence of one's conduct or action should be the ultimate basis for judgment. Sidrick and Mill argued that actions that will result in the most happiness for the most people where the pros outweighs the cons are uh, ethical. So let's now focus on autonomy. In medical practice, autonomy is expressed as a right of a competent adult to make an informed decision about their care. This principle underlies the requirement to seek informed consent from the patient before any investigation or treatment takes place. There are several prerequisite conditions the patient should have capacity. The Mental Capacity Act of 2005 states that the patient should understand, retain, be able to weigh up the, to weigh up the, the discussion and communicate their, their decision. Capacity is time and decision specific, which means for every decision, capacity should be reassessed. Lack of capacity requires you to consider whether or not the patient has any advanced directives or a lasting power of attorney. If not, one should act in the best interest of the patient. If a patient lacks capacity and they want to do something harmful, then they may require sectioning under the Mental Health Act. As well as capacity, for a patient to have autonomous consent the consent must be voluntary. A patient must be free of coercion and the patient should be able to make the decision with their free will. Moreover, the patient should be informed and should have a good grasp of the decision that they're being asked to make. The Bolan principle states that if in a court of law, a group of doctors, even in a minority, would do the same as the doctor in question, then that action was deemed correct. However, following the case of Montgomery versus uh, Lanarkshire, the Montgomery principle has taken precedence, which is not what a reasonable group of doctors would do, but what would a reasonable patient want to know. 
The Mental Capacity Act is there to provide us the framework to make sure that the patient understands the information, retains the information, weighs it up and communicates their decision. Section 1 of this Act sets out five statutory principles that apply to any action taken and the decisions made. A person must be assumed to have capacity unless it's established that they lack capacity. A person is not to be treated as unable to make a decision unless all practicable steps have been taken to help them do so. A person is not to be treated as unable to make a decision merely because their decision is deemed unwise. An act or decision made under the act for or on behalf of a person who lacks capacity must be done in their best interest. And finally, before the act is done, consideration should be given to what is the least restrictive for the patient. When it comes to capacity, consider this important case of refusal of treatment re in 1944. C had paranoid schizophrenia and was detained in Broadmoor Secure Hospital. He developed gangrene in his leg but refused to agree to an amputation which doctors deemed necessary to save his life. The court upheld C's decision to refuse life-saving treatment. The fact that a patient has a mental illness does not automatically mean that they lack capacity to make a decision about medical treatment. Patients who have capacity, that is, those who can understand retain and weigh up and communicate their decisions even if the decisions appear irrational to the uh, doctor or may place the patient's health or their life at risk does not necessarily mean they do not have capacity. The right of a competent adult to refuse treatment is that the mental illness does not in automatically impair the patient's capacity. Advanced directives. When a patient lacks capacity to make a decision they may seek an advance directive. This is a legal document written in advance before a patient loses capacity and they can state their, uh, their desires or their wishes in a situation where they lose capacity. So some patients would say that if they lost capacity, they would not want life-saving interventions or blood transfusions, etc. For an advance directive to be valid, it must be signed, dated and witnessed. A lasting power of attorney. So this is when this is where if a patient loses capacity, they may have appointed somebody to act on their behalf. This can be a financial or health and well-being lasting power of attorney. A holder of a financial lasting power of attorney cannot make health decisions unless they additionally have the health and well-being lasting power of attorney. The person must act in the best interest of the patient and if there's any doubt about the decision making capacity or the decisions made by the lasting power of attorney then the case can be referred to an IMCA or an independent medical or mental capacity advocate. If this does not exist the clinical team can act in the patient's best interest. In most cases when patients are treated in hospital or any other mental facilities they are deemed a voluntary patient. But if a patient requires to be detained, they're known to be sectioned. The Mental Health Act of 1983 is the main piece of legislation that covers the assessment treatment rights of people with mental health disorders. And there are some important sections that you should be aware of. Section 135 and 136 are used in an emergency situation where a patient can be detained by the police. With a section 135, the patient is in a private location such as their home. Police can enter by force if required and detain them under section 135 of the Mental Health Act for a period of 36 hours so that they can be assessed by an advanced mental health uh, practitioner or a doctor. If a person is found in a public location, then a section 136 is used to detain the patient for 36 hours for assessment by a mental health practitioner or a doctor. There are some other sections that you should be aware of. Section 54, this is if a patient in hospital does not have capacity and wants to leave, then nurses under section 54 can detain the patient for up to six hours until a doctor reviews the case. A 52, this is where a doctor can section a patient for up to 72 hours during which further psychiatric assessment can take place. Section 2 is where a patient can be detained and treated against their will for up to 28 days. 
Section three is more powerful and patients can be detained for up to six months. Section 17 is a leave section where a patient can be granted leave and this is uh, authorised by a responsible clinician and can be recalled at any time. Informed consent. Given that the patient needs to weigh up the risks and benefits of the decision that they're required to take, they must have all of the information presented in a palatable and digestible form. The Boland Principle originally stated that if a body of doctors, even in minority, would do uh, as the doctor in question had done, then that would deem acceptable. In 2015, the Montgomery decision has changed the lens with which we perceive this principle. Nadine Montgomery was a woman who had diabetes and was of small stature. She delivered her son vaginally and he experienced complications owing to shoulder dystocia, dystocia which resulted in the child having hypoxic brain injury and consequential cerebral palsy. The obstetrician had not disclosed the increased risk of this complication for Nadine Montgomery uh, and the fact that, the ba that, Mont that Nadine Montgomery's baby could have this potential problem. Montgomery sued for negligence, arguing that if she had known about this increased risk, she would have opted for a caesarean section. The C Supreme Court of the UK judged in her favour and she was reported to have won £5.25 million for negligence in her case. It's established that rather than being a matter of clinical judgment and medical opinion, a patient should be told whatever they want to know, not what the doctor thinks they should know. The Montgomery case firmly rejected the application of the Bolam principle to consent, establishing that the duty has now shifted to from what a reasonable doctor would advise to what a reasonable patient would want to know. And finally, about voluntary consent. Under the Human Rights Act 1998, Article 10 of this Act states that humans have the right of freedom of expression, which includes the right to hold opinions and to receive information. Consider this case of T in 1992. T was a 20-year-old pregnant woman who was injured in a car accident and developed complications that required blood transfusions. She did not indicate on admission that she was opposed to receiving transfusions, but after spending some time with her mother, who was a practicing Jehovah's Witness, she decided to refuse treatment. The Court of Appeal considered that T had been pressurized by her mother and that her ability to decide about transfusion was impaired when medications were, were given to her, impairing her ability to think. The court then allowed the blood transfusions to proceed. So a patient's consent to a particular treatment may not be valid if given under pressure or duress, or a patient's refusal of a treatment may not be valid if it's given under pressure or duress exerted by another person. Here's another case, MB in 1997, MB needed a caesarean section, but panicked and withdrew a consent at the last moment because of her severe needle phobia. The hospital obtained a judicial declaration that it would be lawful to carry out the procedure and, and this was a decision that MB appealed. The court upheld the view that MB had not at the time been competent to refuse treatment because the fear and panic impaired her capacity. Beneficence. Childress and Beecham in the principle of biomedical ethics identify beneficence as one of the core values of medical practice. This is an ethical principle that addresses the idea that clinical actions should promote the benefit and well-being of others. In, the, in a medical context, this means taking the actions in the best interest of the patient and their family. Some scholars such as Egmont Pellegrino argued that beneficent is the only fundamental principle of medical ethics and that's why the Hippocratic Oath emphasizes that healing should be the sole purpose of medicine. Non-maleficence is to do no harm and this is an important aspect of medical ethics. A physician should not go further than prescribing medications um, to reduce the risk of harm. Mal, uh, uh, non malficience is not absolute and needs to be balanced against the principle of beneficence. Also be aware of the impact of vendor relationships. Studies have shown that doctors can be influenced by drug companies, inducements including gift, money and food. 
sponsored medical education, workshops and programs are known to influence prescribing patterns. And there's a growing movement of physicians attempting to diminish the influence of the pharmaceutical industry marketing on medical practice. Stanford University recently banned drug companies sponsoring lunches and gifts. Other academic institutions have banned sponsored gifts, including John Hopkins Medical Institutions, the University of Michigan and Pennsylvania and Yale University, all to try and mitigate the risk of vendor relationship bias. Be aware of the double effect. Double effect refers to two types of consequences that may be produced by a single action. In medical ethics, it's regarded as a combination of beneficent and non-malfeasance. A common example is the use of sedatives in a dying patient. The use of sedation can only be advocated for the benefit of the patient to relieve their suffering rather than shortening their life, acting to deactivate the respiratory drive. And finally, justice, consider opportunity cost. It's important to distribute resources as equally as possible. An opportunity cost is to think what else could be done with this money. For example, if it takes 20,000 pounds, how many smoking cessation clinics can be done? Can 200 people have this intervention and prevent potential lung cancer? Or would you have one major intervention for another patient? Quality-adjusted life years is a utility analysis and a measure of health benefits for medical interventions. These measure the effect of a treatment on how long a patient will live multiplied by the quality of life in those remaining years. So quality combines these factors and can be used to gauge the benefit of drugs or treatment. To calculate quality, one year of less than perfect health has a quality of life value of between zero and one. Death has a value of zero, and qualities are calculated by multiplying the years of life by the quality of life. NICE defines health-related qualities as a combination of a person's overall physical, mental, and social well-being, rather than merely the absence of disease. So if someone has a chronic condition and is expected to live for five years with his present treatment, but whose condition is reducing his quality of life to half of someone in full health, he'd gain five times half, which is two and a half qualities. This is then used to determine whether a drug is, uh, is practicable. The Cancer Drug Fund, by the way, protects the use of cancer drugs and uh, irrespective of their cost, helps facilitate patients who require cancer drugs. Finally, the Workers' Compensation Act in 1979, certain drugs, uh, uh, patients can be compensated, so ethically it's important to determine their cause. So in this lecture, we've covered ethical principles and their philosophical origins. We've discussed autonomy, including the importance of informed and voluntary consent, as well as the Mental Capacity Act, advanced directives, lasting power of attorney, Mental Capacity Act, the importance of beneficence and non-maleficence, the doctrine of double effect and vendor relationships, as well as justice, thinking about opportunity cost, as well as quality adjusted life years. Thank you for attending this Medicine Masterclass.